Morning. I've been reading Alan Watts' The Way of Zen, and it's it's a really interesting book on so many levels. He has such a fascinating mind. I'm just, I, I dig it. But I'm gonna jump in here, and I wanna focus on a specific part in the beginning that I found really interesting, where he's sort of doing an analysis of Confucianism and Taoism, and its impact on Chinese culture and I think Chinese culture has changed a lot. I, I used to go there for business, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar, but I think he makes an incredible parallel between there and here, and then jumps into spirituality through a window in, in a really, in a way that I think is powerful us to take a look at the way we think about God and its impact on our, our society. So I'm gonna start here. So when we turn to ancient Chinese society, we find two philosophical traditions playing complementary parts, Confucianism and Taoism, two things we're not as familiar with in the West. Generally speaking, the former, Confucianism, concerns itself with the linguistic, ethical, legal, and ritual conventions which provide the society with its system of communication. Confucianism, in other words, preoccupies itself with conventional knowledge, and under its auspices, children are brought up so that their originally wayward and whimsical natures are made to fit the procrustean bed of the social order. It's kind of sad. And we have this in the West too, where kids are so sort of whimsical and free and then they get kind of forced into our ideas of who they should be and how they should behave. The individual defines himself and his place in society in terms of the Confucian formulae. Taoism, on the other hand, is generally a pursuit of older men, and especially of men who are retiring from active life in the community. The retirement from society is a kind of outward symbol of an inward liberation from the bounds of conventional patterns of thought and conduct. I like that there's a different method of thought, too, for retirees that are kind of stepping back. I feel like our retirees are more like, I did a lot in business and now I'm either going to go sit on my throne with all my wealth and play golf, but there isn't really a place for them and they kind of become forgotten or purposeless and always talking about what they used to do and there isn't really a new place to think. I love that there's sort of a method of thinking for the freedom of sort of your post-active life. For Taoism concerns itself with unconventional knowledge, with the understanding of life directly, instead of it in the abstract linear terms of representational thinking, which fits being older a lot more, right? Because you're sort of growing out of the conventional ways of thinking and realizing that it was sort of all for naught. And, you know, you spent a lot of time doing that, but the machine continued without you anyway. Confucianism presides then over the socially necessary task of forcing the original spontaneity of life into the rigid rules of convention, a task which involves not only conflict and pain, but also the loss of that peculiar naturalness and unself-consciousness for which little children are so much loved and which is sometimes regained by saints and sages. The function of Taoism is to undo the inevitable damage of this discipline and not only to restore, but also to develop the original spontaneity, which is termed chu zhan, or self so -ness. So it's just how you are, self so -ness. For the spontaneity of a child is still childish, like everything else about him. His education fosters his rigidity, but not his spontaneity. In certain natures, the conflict between social convention and repress repressed spontaneity is so violent that it manifests itself in crime, insanity, and neurosis, which are the prices we pay for the otherwise undoubted benefits, undoubted benefits of the order. Isn't it funny? In certain natures, the conflict between social convention and repressed spontaneity is so violent that it manifests itself in crime, insanity, and neurosis. And isn't that what we're seeing now? We're trying to force so many people into a certain way of thinking. And especially now we live in one of the few cultures where we're constantly told how unsafe we are and how everyone is out to get us. And, you know, then we go, I can't believe people go out and shoot people. And it's like, but you're constantly putting people under extreme duress and stress, thinking that they have a need for survival, that something's to get them, out to get them, when we live in a very safe country. And this is a very interesting phenomenon we have going on in society where we're constantly being berated with how dangerous it is, how much crime there is, how you need to have guns to defend yourself. But the reality is we live in a very safe place. 
And, but the perception is not that we're safe. The more and more people I talk to is like, it's so unsafe here, it's so unsafe here. And I'm thinking, it's really safe here. Unless you're living in a very uh, violent area of particular large city, it's generally very safe. And so it's our thinking that it's unsafe that is creating more uh, or a greater lack of safety. But we don't stop the conversation. We don't say, hey, media and news, maybe you should stop telling us how unsafe we are when it's not true. We just all sort of buy into it and then the whole society starts to sort of crumble and we all become less safe. We could just say, hey guys, we're really safe. We can trust each other. We need to shut off the news, which is making money off of keeping us scared. So we sit at home and just watch TV all the time. But we don't do that. It's really strange. We buy into it. But Taoism must on no account be understood as a revolution against convention although it has sometimes been used as a pretext for revolution. Taoism is a way of liberation, which never comes by means of revolution, since it is notorious that most revolutions establish worse tyrannies than they destroy. To be free from convention, isn't that beautiful, right? Like the more, oh, so often we see that there's a revolution to overthrow a tyrannical government and a worse one takes over. To be free from convention is not to spurn it, but not to be deceived by it. It is to be able to use it as an instrument instead of being used by it, which is happening a lot in our society today. We're being used by our society. The West has no recognized institution corresponding to Taoism because our Hebrew Christian spiritual tradition identifies the absolute God with the moral and logical order of convention. This is a very interesting insight. This might almost be called a major cultural catastrophe right? Because everything's coming from God, not from us. We're sinful in nature. We can't come up with our own moral and logical order. It has to come from God, right? This gets dangerous because with, if you aren't connected to that, then suddenly you're absolute chaos, which isn't true. And that's where sort of Taoism is this beautiful thing. Like we're all part of nature. You can't be separate from it. If God is orderly and logical, so are you. So this might almost be called a major cultural catastrophe because it wait, it waits the social order with excessive authority. So this is what we run into with conservatism and right-wingism and also being of God and America is God's country. And because your social order is becoming now the ultimate authority of God, it's a lot more oppressive and concerning because now you're going to hell if you don't follow it rather than just saying, I'm not following convention. I'm still a good person. Inviting just those revolutions against religion and tradition, which have been so characteristic of Western history. It is one thing to feel oneself in conflict with socially sanctioned conventions, but quite another to feel at odds with the very root and ground of life, with the absolute itself. The latter feeling nurtures a sense of guilt so preposterous that it must issue either in denying one's own nature or in rejecting God. And this is a huge problem we have in the West. I'm rejecting God and choosing my own nature or I'm choosing, right? Or I'm going with God and rejecting my own nature. And in that, that's where we're ending up with so much violence, so much insanity, so much just hidden agendas. We have to realize that we're good either way. And that this is a social convention being put on us. It isn't of God. It's just been programmed into our social convention. I was faced with that. I remember when I was choosing my own nature as a, as a high schooler, my mom was telling me absolutely I was rejecting God and doing that. And it created a severe split in me. So I really get this at a deep level, but not to make this about me, this is, but I understand that this creates a psychic split that can destroy us if we aren't able to see that it's something being put on us. It's not true. Because the first of these alternatives is ultimately impossible, denying your own nature, like chewing off one's own teeth, the second becomes inevitable, rejecting God, where such palliatives as the confession are no longer effective. So then we're stuck at this war with ourselves or with God or both, and we can't really get out of it. And that's how you find people that are serving God, but also raping children, right? There's this extreme break and psychic split in people. And then they say, oh, well, I ask for forgiveness or, oh, it's just my nature and I'm doing my best to serve God. And it doesn't work that way. So as is the nature of revolutions, the revolution against God gives place to the worst tyranny of the absolutist state. Worse because it cannot even forgive. And because it recognizes nothing outside the powers of its jurisdiction. So in other words, once you cast God out, 
and say that when we throw this state out, we're throwing God out. What do you have in its place? There's no forgiveness, right? And just, just the government and law is all there is. For while the latter was theoretically true of God, his earthly representative, the church, was always prepared to admit that though the laws of God were immutable, no one could presume to name the limits of his mercy. So at least when God's ruling the throne, mercy is allowed. When the throne of the absolute is left vacant, the relative usurps it and commits the real idolatry, the real indignity against God, the absolutizing of a concept a conventional abstraction. But is un it is unlikely, this is a great point, that the throne would have become vacant if, in a sense, it had not been so already. If the Western tradition had had some way of apprehending the absolute directly outside the terms of the conventional order. Of course, the very word absolute suggests to us something abstract and conceptual, such as pure being. Our very idea of spirit as opposed to matter seems to have more kinship with the abstract than the concrete. So we have developed an issue by defining something as matter or abstract. That's created a conflict from us from the get-go. But with Taoism, as with other ways of liberation, the absolute must never be confused with the abstract. On the other hand, if we say the Tao is the ultimate reality is called, is the concrete rather than the abstract, this may lead to still other confusions. For we are so accustomed to associate the concrete with the material. The physiological, the biological, and the natural is distinct from the supernatural. But the Taoist and Buddhist standpoints these are still terms for conventional and abstract spheres of knowledge. Biology and physiology, for example, are types of knowledge which represent the real world in terms of their own special abstract categories. And this is where we get confused. We have these as fact. Biology and physiology are fact and God is just woo woo. And I love that Chinese philosophy thinks of these as still abstract ways of thinking about a concrete nature that really can't be made concrete. It's always abstract. So you're just looking through a different lens of biology or physiology. They measure and classify the world in ways appropriate to the particular uses they want to make of it. Someone as a surveyor deals with the earth in terms of acres, a contractor in truckloads or tons, and a soil analyst in types of chemical structures. To say that the concrete reality of the human organism is physiological is like saying that the earth is so many tons or acres. And to say that this reality is natural is accurate enough if we mean spontaneous, shujong, or natura naturans, nature naturing, but it is quite inaccurate if we mean natura natura tata, nature nurtured. That is to say, nature classified, sorted into natures, as when we ask what is the nature of this thing, it is in this sense of the word that we must think of scientific naturalism, a doctrine which has nothing in common with the naturalism of Taoism. Thus, to begin to understand Tao, what Taoism is about, we must at least be prepared to admit the possibility of some view of the world other than the conventional, some knowledge other than the contents of our surface consciousness, <clears throat> which can apprehend reality only in the form of one abstraction at a time. There's no real difficulty in this, for we already admit that we know how to move our hands, how to make a decision, or how to breathe, even though we can hardly begin to explain how we do it in words. We know how to do it just because we do it. Taoism is an extension of this kind of knowledge, an extension which gives us a very different view of ourselves from that which we are conventionally accustomed and a view which liberates the human mind from its constricting identification with the abstract ego. We are so obsessed with thinking we know what knowledge is and thinking we know what fact is versus others. We think biology and physiology, the measurements are fact and they're not. They are identifying the abstract in past terms, it's what exists to explain what happened in past, but that's dead. We have to realize physical matter is really the dead. It's the creative abstract that's generating the physical matter that's the living thing. And so that's the source of power. As long as you're analyzing the dead thing in a Petri dish, you're never really getting the magic, which is the directive force, the consciousness. And Taoism focuses on the consciousness as directing the matter, which is sort of the dead portion. And you can analyze it that way, but don't ever confuse it with the magic and the life force that's coming through consciousness. And with that, let's move on to have a great day. Love you.